Alecky McCarthy, our archivist, as a person who could help us to write the history of the Claritians in the United States. And for the past uh, year, I guess, six months, she has been doing uh, research specifically on our history. But even before that, she has been doing uh, research on the parishes of Chicago. And she, had a, a, uh, she recently wrote a book called Chicago Catolico. And that uh, features very prominently the ministry of the Claritians in South Chicago. And uh, so we are very happy that she has agreed to help us to put together our own history and uh, to have a professional uh, historian write our history of our province. Uh, and the, um, uh, she can explain a little bit about that there's a university that's interested in publishing that history uh, for us. So they would, it would get uh, much bigger attention than just something that we would keep among ourselves. But I'm, I'm very happy. She can tell you a little bit more about herself and her work. Uh, uh, Dr. Deborah Cantor, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Father Rosendo. And thank you all for welcoming me. Um, um, what did I want? You know, so it's nice to be at, it's nice to be with you all. And it's also um, feels good to be at Mandalayan because the first um, Mexican parishes in Chicago were created because of a partnership between the Archbishop and the Claritians. So, um, you know, first the establishment of Our Lady of Guadalupe in South Chicago, and then um, the turnover of St. Francis from German to Spanish-speaking parish. So, but um, Cardinal Mondelian knew that Mexicans needed to be with their own. Um, okay, so, um, Couple things about me, and my plan here is to sort of talk, and I have a lot of images. I'm not reading very much at all, like maybe a paragraph. Um, but, and I wanna leave a lot of time for Q&A, and I want your input and ideas. Um, so I am actually a native of Oak Park, Illinois, which I think most people in this room know where that is. So I got there in 1961, and so did the Claritians. You guys got there a little before I was born. And I went to the high school right around the corner. Um, I uh, am a historian of colonial Mexico by training. And I lived and worked in Mexico for about four years. And um, I got invited to work on this history. I think kind of a combination of the archivist Malachi McCarthy and Father Rosendo. And in early conversations with Father Rosendo, he was like, I'd like you to write a, a book for our guys. And my thought was, I, you know, that's fine. But my thought is I wanted a bigger audience, especially because I think that telling the story of Claritians, one of the things it's doing is telling the story of Latino ministry in the United States. And um, so, and I would say in the course of doing the research, which I've been working very diligently on since maybe October, is, you know, there were two attempts to write histories of your congregation in the U.S. So Father Torrente and Father Berengeras were working on things in the 30s and 40s, and they both passed in the saddle, and it, it never got finished. And I'm very grateful for having this enormous typescript, unedited thing, but it, yeah. And, um, and then um, Father Darius, am I saying his name right? Darius, you know, he wrote a short history of the congregation in 1977 for the 75th anniversary. So um, I am thinking about this. It's going to be a book length thing. It's not going to be an encyclopedia. I'm not going to write about everybody. I am not going to write about every mission and every parish. I'm looking for exemplary stories and people. And I really want to tell stories. And I'm kind of playing with this title. Uh, which some of, I don't know about the on a mission. I, it's a little, but I actually kind of like it because I've been thinking a lot about all the different meanings of mission, of being on a mission. So, and I'm sort of pushing this idea of national Latino ministry, but in the course of doing the research, I have learned so much more about the wider impact of the Claritians on um, US Catholicism. Oops. Try that again. Okay. 
So as um, Father Rosendo mentioned two years ago, my book came out, um, which tells the story of some of the early Mexican parishes in Chicago. The first half of the book is about St. Francis of Assisi in the near west side. The second half of the book is about Pilsen. Um, and one of the things that um, I stressed in that book, a lot of people who, the, who write Latino Catholic history, they write it from one way or the other. Some people have written really top down. It's about priests. It's about the Cardinals Committee for the Spanish speaking. Coming more out of the Chicano movement, you get people writing kind of more bottom up. It's, you know, home altars and curanderas, and it's not really celebrating mass. It's stuff you do in your home with your family. And I feel like you can't, you can't go one way or the other. You have to talk about um, the role of the laity and the role of the clergy. So that's how I'm going. Um, and these are two photos from the archives um, at, um, in downtown Chicago um, from St. Francis in the 1940s. So, you know, I, and I think we have a little bit of the interplay between the Claritians and clergy here. The Claritians really stressing the Immaculate Heart of Mary devotion and bringing in professional photographers to show the little children um, their um, notice to the left, there's a retablo on the wall, which suggests the Claritians were very open to people kind of doing traditional things within a Chicago Catholic church. Um, and the other image was the opening of the St. Francis Gym and Youth Center. And um, the archbishop um, was out there that day, and Father Thomas Matten is in there. And um, a tremendous facility for the working poor people of the near west side of Chicago. Um, this I pulled off of the Claritians website, when I, I, the archives website. When I started considering this project, I went to Malachi McCarthy and I said, you know what? I think the Claritians probably opened up missions and parishes and seminaries in like over a hundred places. And he said, no, no, couldn't have been. And then he started counting them up and he built this map. And um, I don't think, the, I think there's more. And if you click on, obviously, you know, places in um, Texas and California are very densely, um, were very densely impacted by Claritian work. Um, so a little bit about the book. Um, I'm going to uh, start with, you know, the story starts in 1902 when the Claritians were invited to minister in Texas. In their initial 25 years, the Claritians followed the Mexican populations and they inaugurated um, parishes and missions in Arizona, California, and north to Chicago. By the mid 20th century, the Claritians outreach was felt in a wider Catholic America as they created seminaries, established popular Catholic magazines, fostered the lively devotion to St. Jude, and maintained missions in Panama, the Philippines, Guatemala, Japan, etc. Um, and um, a question that I asked myself as I was kind of putting together a book proposal is why tell the Claritian story today? Like other than the fact that Malachi and Father Rosanda were bothering me. So, um, so I, think, I think you all need to probably know more about your early history. I am going to guess that not that many people in this room know a lot about things before 1960 and I kind of know a lot at this point. Um, and then for this wider audience, American Catholic readers, um, Latino communities, Latino college students, um, people in Catholic ministry of any uh, ethnicity, I'm arguing in this book that the Claritian missionaries were inextricably linked to Mexican and other Latino people they served. Their missions and early parishes were often in marginalized communities whose stories deserve telling. Claritian history offers windows into Latino life in many places, from miners in Arizona to steel workers in Chicago, from World War II vets to Central American refugees, from farm workers to college graduates. My book will show how these lively, committed Catholic communities influenced their Claritian pastors. 
And my big argument is that together, lay people and Claritians fostered strong foundations, identities, and voices for Latino Catholics in the United States. So the, this is the kind of um, vision I have for the chapters of the book. I actually am not going to start chronologically in 1902. I'm going to start in 1950, probably. <laughs> I'm going to write it. We'll see how it goes. 1950 with the canonization of um, Antonio Maria Claret. And um, that allows me to tell a little bit about who he was you know, the missionary that he was in Spain and sort of that a little bit about the congregation that grew around him. It allows me to tell the story of the Claritians as a relatively global um, congregation in the mid 20th century. And, I, and there's just really wonderful material from the canonization. And I'm not so interested in what actually happened like at St. Peter's that day in May 1950. Um, I'm very interested in the Claritians that went to the canonization with the tours that they went on to um, Lourdes and to Spain. Um, and they brought lay people with them. So there were lay people, uh, some Hispanic and definitely a lot of Anglos. And, um, and they were also, of course, really stressing the devotion to Claret with his sainthood. But I feel like it was really a moment in 1950 where the Claritians in the United States felt really validated and really affirmed. And actually, one of the signs of that, um, I think it was the night before the canonization, NBC Radio, National Wide, did an hour-long program about Claret and the Claritians with like, you know, radio stars and movie stars and like the, the album, the record album recording, it's in the archive. So I will be able, I've, and um, who was it? Cardinal Spellman would have been the Cardinal in New York. He wrote a poem about Claret for the occasion. So there's very rich material to deal with and it kind of sets up the centrality, the sort of the apogee, I think, of the Claritians in the US. Um, the next chapter will be focusing on the early decades um, where the Claritians were basically kind of on the road following um, Mexican and Mexican-American people wherever they were going. Um, so rural farm workers in places like Martindale, there were all of these mission towns around San Marcos and much wider than that. Um, and um, Anybody who knows the early story of South Chicago and Chicago more broadly. Um, and here we have one of my new personal heroes, Father Inocencio Martin, um, who died unfortunately in 1940. He was hit by a bus in Fort Worth. But anyways, I'm, I'm bringing Father Inocencio back. So, um, and we've got, it's, uh, it's Father Tort, right, in the railway you know, where he's going out to the railway camps scattered all around Chicago, including coming up to Waukegan, which is right near here. And they went to Dodge City, Kansas, um, and, you know, set up catechetical centers and eventually more regular ministry. Um, and um, I want to follow the story of the Mineros, the um, Mexican miners, um, particularly in northern Arizona. I have some really fabulous stories out of Jerome, Arizona and Prescott. And um, so there's some great things there. That ended up actually being an incredibly segregated parish. <laughs> there was one church building, but in the teens, 20s, I think going into the 30s, they were basically running one set of activities for Irish American, European Americans, and one for Mexicans. They had separate first communion parties, separate breakfasts. You know, it tells us a lot about the nature of um, ethnic relations in Northern Arizona at the time. Um, I'm gonna, in the next chapter, move the story into urban areas and um, think about the building of parishes 
urban American Catholic parishes, which also served as refugios, as refuges um, for people um, recently arrived from Mexico, maybe fleeing the revolution, maybe fleeing from the Cristero Wars in the 1920s. Um, and I think they were both um, refugios, refuges, and a place to be Mexicano. And at the same time, they were also places that people became Americanized to a certain degree. That's a lot of the story that I told in Chicago Catolico, both sort of maintaining a Mexicanidad and becoming American Catholics sort of simultaneously. Um, some of the places that I want to write about, um, I want to write about the story of Immaculate Heart of Mary in um, downtown San Antonio, where I was so fortunate to visit um, last week. And um, anyway, so we've got uh, the ushers, Los Usheres, 1934, in the middle of the Depression. Um, this was actually Father Luis Olivares's um, parish and his father was one of the ushers, and I'm able, um, in part because of historian Mario Garcia's book, able to sort of piece together um, the ways the parish allowed his parents to meet. And then the school gets built in 1926, and Father Lewis and his brother and his siblings all go to school there. Um, and um, I was out visiting some Mexican cemeteries around um, San Marcos and San Antonio, and I was just so struck by a gravestone. It's 1952, this Señorita Maria de Jesus Chavez. What does it say on there? Her parents remember that she was so proud of her Sagrado Corazón de Maria, that this was her big thing. She was part of the arch confraternity, right? Um, that was like, there were a lot of great things in the cemetery, but that was like, oh my God. So, you know, there's, there's this synergy going on between these Claritian parishes and um, the Mexican-American people there. Um, and um, on the bottom there, we've got the baseball team. I think we're in the 1950s at Our Lady of Guadalupe in South Chicago. Um, and I think that's Father Tony Brisky, am I right? I think so. Um, in street clothes, because I guess he's coaching, or I'm not sure what's going on. And then we've got Perth Amboy, um, which is, uh, you know, the Claritians really wanted to move out east in addition to moving west and north to Chicago. Um, and one of the real um, movers and shakers there was Father Thomas Matten, the, the German who spoke Spanish just like a Mexican. So um, when I first started doing my research, I don't know why people in Chicago said, did you know Father Thomas? You know, he passed away in, I think, 1977. I got to this in 2000, so I didn't know him, but whatever. And sometimes people would tell me my Spanish was as good as his. So that was like a very high standard. Um, anyways, and one of the things that's really super interesting to me about Perth Amboy is that it is an East Coast parish and it is, it's not really a Mexican parish. It's truly a Spanish-speaking parish um, with people from many different parts of the Caribbean. And um, Father Thomas was always up for starting from scratch. Also in this chapter on the urban parishes, I think I'm gonna tell the story of Our Lady of Solitude in East LA. Um, but I also really wanna tell the story of um, um, Santo Nino, which was in Palo Verde, Chavez Ravine, and I, I've been doing research on that for a long time, but they were connected, so I think I can get it all in. Um, in a middle chapter of the book is going to deal with um, some identity issues within the congregation, and I'm going to use language as a way to talk about that. Um, the original um, missionaries who came in, they came from Spain. That was like a big part of how American Catholics saw them as Spaniards. In some of the literature in Mexican American Catholic history, there's this kind of assertion that because they were Spaniards, they didn't connect with people. And what I would say based on my research so far is some of them connected really, really well. And then others, you know, they didn't. And I don't necessarily know it was, you know, it was probably personalities. So. They come in, they're brought in to um, San Antonio and, and brought to LA and Chicago because they speak Spanish, right? Except 
very quickly upon arriving, they're learning English. And they know that they need to be part of this American Catholic network. You know, when the uh, church burns down in San Marcos in 1915, they know how to write the right letter to the Extension Society in Chicago, which has got to be in, you know, the Queen's English. And um, so, and I think there's always this sort of interesting kind of give and take between ministering to Spanish speaking and reaching out to English speaking Americans. And I think we have some very interesting stories out of South Chicago with that because of the St. Jude devotion, which ended up going primarily towards um, Euro-American Catholics in the middle of a Mexican church. So that's a great dynamic right there. Um, the connections with the Chicago St. Jude Police League, which literally funded the creation of St. Jude Seminary. Um, I've got fabulous records from St. Jude Seminary. I've been looking there to figure out how much they were actually teaching Spanish and who was teaching Spanish. And, um, you know, many of the people who were going to go on from seminary and become vocations wanted to be missionaries. I think a lot of them wanted to be foreign missionaries, um, as Father Richard Todd uh, told me. Um, anyway, so there's this... And, I, and the other thing that I'm interested in with both Dominguez and, and St. Jude's is um, to what extent um, Mexican-American vocations are being brought into the congregation. And it's, um, it's, it's sticky. <laughs> so there are years at St. Jude's where there were like no Mexican-American boys being brought in while they had St. Francis and Our Lady of Guadalupe. And, um, and then there's years where there's a few, and it's interesting, you know, who makes it through, who feels affirmed. I'm planning on using Father Sevi Lopez's um, memoir in, as a way of talking about that. The biography of, um, of Father Luis Olivares also raises issues about that. Um, you know, we all know about the Claritians and Catholic publications, um, the Voice of St. Jude, the Immaculate Heart Messenger. Um, but by the 1930s, they were publishing a weekly in Spanish, La Esperanza, and the entire run, by the way, it's online from out of, I think, Notre Dame, or the Catholic News Archive. Um, and so, you know, this attempt to reach out more broadly to the people, not just in their parishes. Um, okay. Even though I was asked to write a book about the Claritians in this province, I'm getting a little beyond the borders. And I, I'm a historian of Latin America by training. Who could resist telling the story of the Claritians in Panama and in Guatemala? And the records are pretty fabulous. And um, I'm, I'm not going to write much about the Philippines or Japan. That's not my wheelhouse. I write about what I know and or know decently. Um, what I, I, when I first started researching Panama and Guatemala and the Claritians, I had it all kind of jumbled. And like, oh, it's tropical, and oh, there are indigenous people. And then I started looking at the records, and it's like, these were very distinct um, mission fields and, and, and um, different approaches. So, you know, there were two um, Claritians who came out of the United States who were named bishops. Um, in Guatemala, so that's um, Bishop uh, Joseph uh, Preciado, who had been at Immaculate Heart of Mary in San Antonio, um, and he becomes the Bishop of Darian. And I feel like this photograph, professional photograph, this typifies a lot of what was going on. They had a pretty big um, mission field with Kuna people in the islands, um, and they always show them at their most exotic. So this is the 30s and the 40s and going to the 50s. We're always seeing the nose ring. We're always seeing the barefoots. And um, you know he's teaching catechism to the, um, to the indigenous people here. And um, I actually, in my research, have found out that Bishop Preciado was probably spending half of his year in the United States every year. He, he would come up and he would do this tour. He'd go to Los Angeles. He'd go to Texas. He'd go to Chicago. A lot of it was about fundraising. Um, maybe some of it was getting out of the weather, which everybody found miserable. So um, anyways, so there's the Panama story, which strikes me as kind of paternalistic. 
um, the good um, the good Catholic priest teaching the innocent, exotic, or primitive indigenous people. Then you get to Guatemala. Um, the congregation starts the missions in Guatemala in 1966, mostly coming out of Chicago. Um, Father Greg Zimmerman, I think, there. And notably, the clothing has changed. <laughs> so, you know, when they celebrated mass, of course, they wore a cassock. Although the cassocks, I'm noticing, had all kinds of trim and decoration that spoke to the people who they were serving. So in the Afro, uh, Afro-Guatemalan town of Livingston, they were wearing stoles made out of this checked fabric, which black Guatemalans wear in coastal Guatemala. Um, so the, the 1966 and going up very much speaks to a change um, in approach. Um, a lot of team ministry working very closely with sisters um, from a variety of orders. And um, so that's where I'm going with that. Which will then kind of take me to um, the next chapter where I want to get at the shifts of the era um, following Vatican II. Um, there's definitely some new things going on. So like the recruitment, the vocational literature just starts looking very different. Um, and, um, you know, I can look at chapter records and see what people are talking about. And there's a lot of new things happening. Um, I've mostly done the historic, the old historic stuff, like going up to 65. And I haven't done a ton of research on the last 60 years. Ouch, that's a lot. Um, but some things that I am thinking about, and I will love your input today, or send me emails. Um, you know, what are places I should be writing about? What are stories I should tell? What are people who have kind of remarkable, compelling stories? Some things that I'm thinking about from this time period, late 60s, going into maybe the 80s, you know, the rise of Cursillo. Although Cursillo actually predates Vatican II, so that's a whatever. Um, Claritian volunteers, Claritian lay missionaries. Um, experimental apostolates, the Ave Center in the Bay Area, um, uh, Mission Claret in Oregon. Um, so I, these are things I kind of have my eye on and I'm looking for more ideas. Um, and we'll, I think we'll come back here. Um, and I'm thinking about doing a short epilogue <laughs> um, about Claritians today, like Cl Claritian um, ministry, um, and I'm thinking, you know, as I'm visiting some parishes, maybe highlighting some places today, or highlighting some Claritian legacy parishes, like this little tiny Martindale, Texas, with a thousand people. The Claritians, you know, they started things there, and they ran it for decades. It's diocesan. It belongs to the Diocese of Austin, but gosh, I was at Mass there. Um, it's so about two weeks ago. I don't, I don't go to that many churches that are full anymore. I mean, especially with the pandemic, right? And like the energy in that room, it was pretty incredible. And then like up in the choir loft, there's a standard with Claret, which like, I don't know that that many people there know who he is. They don't know why they are devotees of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. They have no idea. So I was talking with older people. They're like, can you get us some like pins? Like, yeah, I'll talk to people. We'll get you pins. So, but you know, they're doing it because like their parents were, you know, devoted to the Immaculate Heart and clearly because of Claritian influence. Um, so, Fresno, right? I guess I got Fresno there. Yeah. I, yes, I stole it off of your Facebook page. Thank you. So, it's such a great image. Um, and uh, let me just sort of share one more thought here. So this is kind of from my, my book proposal. And I, I have shopped this out to two academic presses. New York University Press says, send me chapters. They have a great list in Latino studies. They have a great religious studies uh, thing. And I hear great things about the editor there. Um, so 
if that works out, great. If it doesn't work out, my probably my next stop would be Fordham University Press, which I think does a really good job with American Catholic things. Um, so I'm arguing in this book that the Claritian, let's see, well, this is the end. When the Claritians arrived in the US, Spanish speakers constituted a small and often rec unrecognized part of Spanish America. I'm sorry. Spanish speakers constituted a small and often rec unrecognized part of ca of Catholic America. Today, Latinos constitute half of US Catholics. The Claritian missionaries pioneered Latino ministry across the US with vibrant parishes from Los Angeles to New Jersey, from San Antonio to Chicago. So that's kind of what I'm up to. Um, and while my archivist friends aren't here, um, there's no way I could have gotten as far as I've gotten without the work of um, Malachi McCarthy who is retiring this summer, so after 17, 18 years. And I'm going to interview him before he goes because he has so much experience and so much knowledge. He can just like look at a photo from 1920 and tell you every Claritian who's in the photo. He's kind of amazing that way. Um, and, um, and Doris Cardenas, who um, has been there for five or six years, and they have both been very generous in hunting things down and reacting to things that I'm doing. I'm writing um, maybe like a bi-weekly blog on my findings from the archives, and they're putting it up on the archives website. So if you're bored, you know, there's like a picture and two paragraphs, so <laughs> small. Hopefully the whole book could be like that. I wouldn't have to write whole chapters with arguments, but I will. So, um, oh, and this last photograph, uh, which uh, sometimes there are just these random, like shoe boxes of photographs. This might be from, there was a lot of photographs from Father Henry Herrera. And um, maybe this is from his, but it doesn't matter. These are the, the priests of San Antonio from the different parishes. It's um, Father Sevi is here. He's somewhere probably in the early 40s. And um, there's a companion picture of the altar boys. So the altar boys and the priests have gone on a picnic day, and the boys are all there with their bottles of pop, and their shoes are off, and they're running around wherever they are. And, um, and I, you know, I just love these kind of like uh, intimate, unstaged moments. It's just a snapshot and they're, you know, I forget what it's called, drinking out of the wine sack. I don't know what that's called. And there's the berets and, you know, um, I, I think there's a photo where Father Sevi's maybe wearing a baseball cap that day. And I just sort of, you know, you get the sense of a congregation and, you know, a kind of brotherhood, which is nice. So, so that's what I'm. Uh, that's what I am doing, and I guess I'm um, opening things up for your uh, comments. And the book is, you know, it's in flux. I'm. Um, I've spent a pretty intensive last six months doing a lot of research, and I'm gonna. I haven't been home for like half of the last six months. So I went to Texas. I kept going to Chicago. I went to New Jersey, and um, so this summer I'm gonna stay home and get my chiles and tomates in the garden and um, start writing. So I hope to get a couple of chapters done, then I'll go back and to the archives when the weather gets lousy and um, I will be doing site visits. So, and I will be getting in touch with y'all when I go out to places um, in the early fall or next winter. And also, just a little bit there, the back of that, that's the um, Cronicas for the house at San Marcos. It's like 1907, and they're talking about like going out to Martindale to, to celebrate Mass and to say communion and this and that. What do we have? Dia de los Santos Reyes. De los Santos Reyes. So, um, this is the kind, I love when, I love when the Claritians had good handwriting. I'll just say that. So, so and, and sometimes, you know, Spanish is fine. This is a handwriting that can be an issue. But like, sometimes I'll open like, a, you know, a random box of personal effects. And it's like, oh, like letters from Spain. And then I'm like, but I can't really read this. 
because it's written in Basque, right? It's written in Euskera. Or the letters where I think I can read them, and then I realize, like, oh, this letter is in Catalan. Like, I can make out about a third of what's going on here. And um, a lovely moment thinking about the ways that um, Claritians, you know, were reliant on the occasional letters that were coming back from home. Um, the ways that the Spanish Civil War um, was really sort of wrenching apart the congregation and also these families. So, you know, times where I think there were years without real communication going on. So, thoughts? I looked at uh, your project, it's very, very thorough. Uh, I was very encouraging listening to you uh, about the early beginnings of the, of the Claritians, the dynamics between the Spaniards and becoming anglicized, the Spaniards becoming anglicized, and the way they view the first Mexican American vocations, or none at all. You know, the fact that you cite, that you mentioned that there were no vocations in certain periods in the growth of the Claritians. It does reflect the uh, kind of um, uh, dark yeah. <laughs> moments yeah. in the Claritians, uh, where Mexican Americans were not fully accepted, even within the congregation, even though they were ministering to Mexican Americans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole variety of ways to get at that. Like I can have like graduation day photos from um, Dominguez, and the whole like you know like big panoramic shot of all the people who are there. And you can see these like Mexican American families who are there because their sons are graduating. And uh, so that's a nice thing. Uh, oh, St. Jude's in moments, you know, was occasional. It, it, was not an, it was not really a regular set of things. So. Um, if you look at the names of the first brothers, most, most of them were Mexican American from Mexico. Okay. But very okay. Huh. okay. So, and there's a brother's book on its way to you all, so which is getting finished up, which I plan on. I let, I'm letting those people write that book, so I will just use it. Um, I also, uh, mentioning the thing about um, the early brothers, there's a really nice community history from San Marcos. And um, they mentioned, you know, sort of early like leaders in the San Marcos um, Latino community and a number of them were brothers who, they left the order and they married local women. And you know, it was interesting to think about that kind of cross-fertilization. So, you know, they were Spaniards, so. And I've been able to do a little bit of research on Mexico. Well, I think probably a decent amount. Like I read the Annales um, for maybe the first 20 years of um, the Mexican uh, province and I can see like you know I know that Father Inocencio before he went to Texas he was working um, missions in Puebla and Veracruz those were not great places to work that was that you know there's, I, I can see where they're fighting um, uh, anti-catholicism anti-clericalism in Mexico places where people try and shut down Claritian missions in you know, Monterrey and places like that. They, they, it was both a rich mission field and a complicated one. Like as early as the 1890s, there's all this anti-clericalism that's bubbling up in Mexico. And so I, you know, I can trace that and make connections with some individuals. Thank you. Do you think there's any way of uh, synopsizing or serializing some of this for something like U.S. Catholic articles. That's a, a, really, That's good a, a really good idea. So, you know, like I'm, it's a pretty new thing for me writing blogs and I like the idea of kind of being more public and um, a lot of these things will work as standalones. Like, you know, some of these chapters that I'm writing, like the one on um, building the urban parishes, making refugios or whatever, you know, it's like, there's gonna be like 10 pages on San Antonio, there's gonna be like 10 pages on South Chicago, 10 pages on LA, and they will be connected, especially because of some personnel, but they will also, I think, you know, we should be able to take them out. And there's also things I'm researching that I know I'm probably not gonna write about, and so I can also see like spinning things off. And um, yeah, US Catholic and 
Commonweal is sitting on an article I wrote about the Virgin of San Juan devotion in Chicago. So maybe if I get in there, there's, there's another venue. So it was kind of scary as an academic to send something to like normal readers, but it's also kind of like, oh, I didn't need footnotes. So that was good. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, I entered uh, the, the Lamo Seminary in California in 1953. And re responding somewhat to what Tony said, uh, it had the reputation of being a Mexican seminary. And sometimes I heard comments uh, from uh, seminarians who were at white Anglos. And when they said, I'm going to that Claritian seminary, the pastor of, the sem uh, of the, the, this particular young man would say to him, why are you going to that Mexican seminary? And so it, when I entered, there was there were a lot of mm -hmm. Mexicans, mm -hmm. and, and that was all the way through into, into philosophy and theology too. So I don't I don't know if there was a difference between the the, the Lamo and and, and Saint Jude. I think I there were know. big dif I think there were big differences in terms of local networks. Um, that's a really interesting anecdote, and I, I mean a lot of what was going on with Saint Jude's in in Chicago. Police league people were sending their kids and their nephews. So they were very, you know, like, I don't know what proportion of those kids, those young boys were coming out of like firefighter and police families and an awful lot of coming out of like very specific Irish Catholic Southside parishes, which is Southsiders, it was like closer to, you know, go and drop off your boy or for him to take the train home or for you to visit on, you know, Father Sunday and this and that. Yeah, there were Northsiders, but there was very strongly Southside. And, and I think that the police league gave the Claritians a big legitimacy in Chicago. So, you know, they would have those um, processions and masses in like the 30s and the 40s and the 50s going into the 60s where, you know, there would be like 10,000 people attending a mass and the mayor of Chicago was there eating the breakfast with them. And so I, I think I have a few people here who might be able to tell me a little bit more about that. But um, the lines are pretty clear. I, in part, because I want to I'm thinking about Dominguez as like a point of, Dominguez and Delamo as a point of comparison, but I think I'm really gonna focus on St. Jude because of the connections to South Chicago and Our Lady of Guadalupe. And also, if you wanna know more about the historical stuff at Dominguez, Mario Garcia's biography of Father Luis, you know, does a quite a, very detailed. <laughs> There's like 70 pages on the curriculum. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Hello. We have, we have two graduates from St. Jude mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Father I've seen their grades. I've seen their grades. Father Eddie was one of the top volunteers we had. Okay. Okay. And also, there's a movie with the, narrated by uh, Danny Thomas, For Heaven's Sakes. It's all about mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. You all know, get, get a lot of information from that. And, and I, I played that movie. I got an uh, Academy Award for acting. I was going to confession in the jungle for a strong uh, Father Mitchell. Wow. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so I, I have a, Maliki gave me a, I have a DVD of those, that vocation movie. And I forget what the, what is it? A Man Amongst Men was another one um, from, I think before Vatican II. So, great, thank you. Hello. 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 Uh, I think along with um, other places to uh, look into, such as US Catholic, we should also look at the academy. And the academy would be interested in something like this, as long as it doesn't take a turn of becoming a hagiography. <laughs> Um, if it's a hagiography, then it'd just probably be nice in our parish um, shelves there. But if it's more than that, along the lines of what Tony Diaz was saying, I think that the, uh, the Academy of Catholic Hispanic Theologians would be very interested because it documents not only exploration, but documents Latino uh, history. So you're talking about Actus? So you're talking about Okay. Yeah. So, um, 
Yeah, and I, um, you know, it was funny when I got invited to do this. I was like, can I write about the Claritians with bruises and all, you know? Because I, I didn't want to write a hagiography, no way. And although in the process of researching this book, boy, there were some stories where I was like, I, don't, I, I Father Thomas Matton was like kind of my my hero in telling the Saint Francis story, and um, and I, 15 years ago I went to California to like find out more information about him, and um, he was also imperfect. I know all kinds of things about him, um, but you know like that the the builder thing, the builder, the making connections. He's a very good example of somebody who did not grow up speaking English. And boy, could Father Thomas Matton write a press release. Oh my God. And every city where he worked, these Catholic papers or, and, or the local papers would run these news stories about you know the opening of a new school. He wrote them word by word. And uh, you know when he came to the United States, I think it was 34, 33, 34, he came to raise money for his province, for Germany. And he thought he was like here to raise money. Well, things changed in Germany and he never really, well, he went back very briefly after the war, but you know, I've read some of his personal letters. He was not always thrilled with the fact that he was stuck in Hispanic ministry. They sent him at, um, I think at the beginning of the, maybe 42 or something, he gets sent to El Paso. He'd been working in LA, um, Santo Nino and Our Lady of Solitude. And um, the di it was I think it was basically the diocese, the archdiocese, um, says he can't stay in LA, and so the congregation sends him to El Paso. He was despondent. He was he was thinking about leaving. And he, <laughs> so um, it, it, interesting, to, you know. I think in Los Angeles he was part of a much broader community. He had all of these German Catholic friends. Um, and he had clearly built a lot, a lot of very positive relationships with um, Mexican immigrants. And he had this whole nocturnal adoration thing going at La Placita. And, um, and he, you know, so he's somebody who I admire a lot, but I also know this is not, it's not like a linear story, right? So yeah, no, no, uh, I'm not turning anybody into saints. Is buried at San Gabriel, and there are two plots that are always have fresh, fresh, fresh flowers. Father Aloysius and mm -hmm. Father Matins. Mm -hmm. They always have fresh I flowers. I cannot believe how many lay people out of the woodwork have contacted me about him. Everybody's got a story. So, yeah. Um, by the way, I was telling Father Rosendo uh, just before. So, I was in San Antonio. I was supposed to be there for eight days, but Southwest canceled my flight, so lucky me, I got the ninth day, which was actually great, and it allowed me to have the time to go find where your guys are buried. And I didn't have a plot number, and so I was gonna go San Fernando number two, I was gonna go to the office and on the door, appointment only. And I thought, oh my God, you know, like, my plane leaves in five hours. I don't have a time to make an appointment. So I grab a gardener, and I say, where's like the older section of San Fernando two? that way and thinking I'm never going to find them so and then there is this like roundabout section and there's some big tombstones in the shape of crosses and I sort of was like what is that so they were some of the early bishops of San Antonio and I was like oh like I know who these guys are so Archbishop Drossertz and Bishop Shaw or Forrest I was like I'm going to go pay my respects to them because they're part of the story <laughs> who's who's at their feet so there's, there's 30 tombstones of brothers and fathers from the Claritians. And um, that was the kind of moment that I realized that your guys are sort of becoming my guys. Like I just, there were a lot of things about being there that, I mean, it was a, kind of my journey as a researcher, you know? And it taught me some things, sort of seeing where they are. And um, Father Alvarado, somebody's bringing flowers. Father Inocencio, you know, so he was a Spaniard who he didn't have people here. So. It's called St. Francis, yeah, and uh, it was taken away from us, and uh, they were not the top. Yeah. Yeah. But the people we trained, next to the people, they stayed at church, 
any of that stuff. And now I guess uh, the whole community changed to a more wealthy than we, than we have the church. That so that's, have. you know, I kind of epilogue stuff that I tell in here. And um, yeah, I, I've done a, a quite a bit of research on the, you know, they took out those stained glass windows. They ended up in a Korean Catholic church probably 10 minutes from here. So near the Our Lady of Guadalupe Shrine. So the original windows are there. And there's some Claritian names at the bottom with the Korean Catholics, but they got to put in these beautiful, new, very Latin American windows. Um, Father Art Perez from the diocese was uh, kind of spearheaded the, the decision-making progress process for the iconography. But yeah. Uh, Father Mildred Alvarez was there at Paris. Oh, okay. Collaborated, make sure to quit. Yeah, them. and I, I know a lot of the like lay leaders there, and um, I was at their last, they made me stay for a parish council meeting, their last one with their diocesan priest, Father Don Nevins, who they loved. Father Don, he's 70 ish, still working. Maybe he's older than 70. Um, he spent his entire life in Hispanic ministry in Chicago. And um, they loved Father Don. He was the one who took over in 2000. And that was the last one with him leading the Paris Council meeting because they got, um, uh, I, I think they're called IVEs. They're uh, Argentine. It, it feels pretty different in there. It's like a very different ball game. <laughs> so does not feel the same to me at all when I go to visit. So. Milton is Guatemala. Okay. Okay. To, to our Livingston? Yes. Okay. <laughs> he, was a, he, was, he was a Jesuit, but two of our priest kid after the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Father Mildred so, um, so um, yeah, so I'm, you know, I'm staying for lunch. I'm coming back for dinner. So I would love to engage people in conversation. Um, and um, as I'm writing about places, I might be sending drafts to some people who know these geographies better than I do. Um, I, I think I'm going to Los Angeles. I think I'm gonna go to Perth Amboy kind of want to go to Fresno, but let's not, my, my aunt lives a half hour away, so that's also a plus. Plus I actually like, I taught Chicano history, so it's like the Central Valley, how could I not want to go? So this is like holy ground. So, um, and I'm gonna be spending some time in South Chicago, which I know, kind of, but haven't, you know, I, I chose for Chicago Catolico, I, I chose to focus on St. Francis. So early on I did research on it, and I've spent, you know, I've had, um, what is it, you know, Menudo in the basement with the ladies. So I brought my dad once, like 20 years ago. My dad had a great time with the ladies in the basement. So um, he was always my fan, my dad. He loved this project, so, which is okay, whatever. <laughs> so, uh, you know, he, he knew it was Chicago history and, and he liked Mexico. So he was, he was like, I've never been to South Chicago. Take me with you. Okay, dad, sure. So a lot of people in Chicago have never been to South Chicago. Anyway, so um, yeah, I think we're good. I have um, bookmarks from Chicago Catolico, which um, I could hand out. So I brought, I have my business cards. I brought like 10 copies of this. I promised two of them to people, but I am very happy to sell them to people at the cost to me, which is like $12. And if we can't do that, you can email me and for 15 to cover postage, I will mail you a copy. So, I, I think we're good. Are we good? We're good, okay. Thank you uh, very much. That was just a wonderful, wonderful presentation to see some of the history, both for the people who were a part of it, those who've heard the stories before, and those for whom it was brand new. And I, ha I have to admit, I even got a little 
a little teary-eyed when pictures of Martindale and some of the places that even I've been and, and worked at in my first assignment come up. They're, they're like seeing pictures of your great-grandparents and things like that, so it's wonderful. Um, we'll be having uh, our break. We've got lunch at noon, and then we're free until 2 with the reminder that those who have arrived in the province within the last five years, I'd like to meet with you uh, at 1 o'clock in room 103 of this building. So, and then, so after break, for those of you who are not in that newly arrived group, we have the treasurer's report in this room at 2 o'clock. <laughs>